Hey everyone, it's Dr. Marcon. Uh, we are starting up with part two of chapter 13. We left off with the olfactory complex um, and then we're going to finish up with the senses as well as the other parts of the brain. Um, I want you guys to focus mostly on, you know, what the area areas of the brain do. Um, not so much of the location, but um, we'll go through this hopefully relatively quickly. Um, so the visceral sensory areas, uh, meaning getting stimuli from the viscera, um, this visceral sensory area is located within the lateral sulcus and on the fifth lobe, which is the insula. Okay, again, that's considered the fifth lobe, if you guys remember doing your crossword puzzle. It will receive general sensory input from the viscera, um, including pain, pressure, and of course, hunger. That's all I have to say about that. Um, now we get into the motor areas. Okay, so we have cortical areas controlling motor function. We have the premotor cortex, the primary motor cortex, which is located on the precentral gyrus, just anterior to the central sulcus of Rolando. Um, other motor, motor areas include the frontal eye field as well as Broca's area, um, and all are localized in the posterior frontal lobe. Okay, so sort of on that border between the frontal and parietal lobe. So the premotor cortex is anterior or in front of the precentral gyrus, which is the primary motor cortex. The premotor cortex controls more complex movements. Uh, will receive process sensory information such as visual, auditory, and general somatic sensory. Controls voluntary actions dependent on the sensory feedback and is involved in planning movements. Okay. Whereas the primary motor cortex, which we talked about, is located in the precentral gyrus, just in front of the central sulcus of Rolando. I can roll my R's all day. So the primary motor cortex controls motor functions. Um, it is also known as the somatic motor area. Um, it contains pyramidal cells. Pyramidal cells are large neurons of the primary motor cortex. The corticospinal tracts, these are the tracts that will go down, uh, sending motor stimuli uh, through the brain stem and spinal cord. So within the corticospinal tracts, you have axons that will uh, signal motor neurons to control skilled movements. And these are actually contralateral, contra meaning opposite or uh, the other. So contralateral meaning they're on the opposite side because at the, uh, the pyramids, uh, we have axons that will cross over to the opposite side of the brain at that decussation of the pyramids. We know that specific pyramidal cells control specific areas of the body. Face and hand muscles are controlled by many pyramidal cells. And note this word, somatopy, somatotopy, excuse me, somatotopy. Um, the body is represented spatially in the primary motor cortex. So according to your crossword, somatotopy, somatotopy, um, is the CNS's way to map its neurons. So here is a familiar figure. This is again the homunculus um, with the body being mapped in the primary cortex and the somatosensory cortex of the cerebrum. So we have sensory on the right, motor on the left, and we can see how different parts of the different, um, the either precentral gyrus or postcentral gyrus affect uh, the different parts of the body. Okay, so starting more medially, we can see that the medial portion of the precentral gyrus are, um, starts with the toes and then works its way up the leg to the knee, the hip, the trunk, shoulder, arm, elbow, wrist, hand, fingers, and the thumb. And then uh, more laterally uh, within the precentral gyrus, you can see that uh, this part of the gyrus will affect or will get, provide innervation to the neck, the brow, eye, face, lips, jaw, tongue, um, as well as the uh, 
motor functions of swallowing. Okay, so this is the primary motor cortex within the precentral gyrus. On the right, this is the primary somatosensory cortex, which is the postcentral gyrus. And again, just like the um, motor cortex or the precentral gyrus, uh, the homunculus shows what areas of the body are um, the precent or I'm sorry, yeah, the postcentral gyrus is receiving information from. Okay. So the frontal eye field lies anterior to the premotor cortex and will control the voluntary movement of the eyes, especially when moving the eyes to follow a moving target. Broca's area, um, this is located in the left cerebral hemisphere. So Broca's area of speech manages speech production. It is connect connected to language comprehension areas in the posterior association area. Um, so just know that Broca's area for speech is in the left cerebral hemisphere. We do have a corresponding region in the right cerebral hemisphere that will control emotional overtones to spoken words. So on the left, uh, the Broca's area controls the motor movements that is necessary for speaking. Um, on the right, also known as the intuitive emotional uh, area, it controls, again, the emotional overtones given to spoken words. If you have damage to your Broca's area, uh, most of these patients d uh, exhibit deliberate non-fluent speech with impaired articulation, uh, but they can understand most aspects of the speech of others. So we have uh, multimodal association areas. These are large regions of the cerebral cortex that will receive sensory input um, from multiple sensory modalities and from the sensory association areas. Uh, this area allows you to make associations with between the kinds of sensory information. So the multimodal area also associates new sensory inputs with memories of past experiences and will plan appropriate motor responses. So there are actually three multimodal association areas. You have the posterior association area, the anterior association area, and the limbic association area. Again, uh, focus on what these areas do. For example, posterior association area, um, this is located at the interface of the visual, auditory, and somatosensory association area, so kind of near the, uh, or within the occipital lobe of the brain. The posterior association area will um, integrate sensory information into sort of a unified perception. It allows awareness of a spatial location of the body or body sense, and is also related to language comprehension and speech. I'm not going to focus too much on dorsal stream versus ventral stream. Um, you guys can read up on that. Um, but here, um, sort of in the uh, near the Wernicke's area, um, you can actually see another figure. It's 1313 your book, and it shows the different multimodal so, uh, association areas in violet. Uh, the posterior association area is is right about here, um, sort of on that border um, between occipital lobe and, and parietal lobe. Um, and sort of going into the temporal lobe. Um, and then you have the anterior association area. Um, we can see that um, it is located uh, within the frontal lobe, um, basically in the uh, prefrontal cortex here and we'll talk about the anterior association area. Uh, the third one is the limbic system and uh, we can see it better in a sagittal section. But really quick to note about the posterior uh, association area. Um, with regards to these streams, basically um, these streams, we have a dorsal stream and a ventral stream. The dorsal stream will extend to the post central gyrus and will perceive information about your spatial relationships. 
Um, this is the where pathway, so the location of objects where in relation to your body. Um, the ventral seam passes information into the inferior part of the temporal lobe, and it is responsible for recognizing objects, words, and faces. Uh, this is the what pathway, so identifies what objects. Okay, so you have the where, which is the dorsal stream, and you have the what in the ventral stream. And here is that dorsal stream, you know, the, the where pathway, and the ventral stream, which is the, the what pathway. Uh, the auditory pathway um, goes from the auditory association area through the multimodal association areas. Um, so, so we have two streams. Uh, the auditory stimuli is processed in two streams. Um, we have uh, the where pathway again and the what pathway. So the where pathway uh, going from the parietal lobe and lateral parts of the frontal lobe, uh, which evaluates the location of sound. And then you have the what pathway. Um, what is the sound? Okay, and this is the anterior region of the temporal lobe and inferior region of the frontal lobe. So the where pathway and the what pathway. So again, where is the sound coming from? Uh, this is the um, posterior lateral where pathway, and then you have the anterior lateral what pathway. So in the posterior association area, you have what's known as the Wernicke's area. Wernicke's area is responsible or function in, um, functions in speech comprehension. Okay, so understanding speech. We had Broca's area of speech, which basically dealt with uh, the, mo the motion and the motor movements for speech. Wernicke's area is more of speech comprehension. Um, so coordination of auditory and visual aspects of language. And then initiation of word articulation and recognition of sound sequences. We have areas in the right cerebral hemisphere that will act in the creative interpretation of words, um, as well as de dealing with the emotional overtones of speech. Like you can hear someone speak and you can tell if they're sleepy, if they're stressed out, or if they're happy and um, excited. Um, so these association areas kind of help you interpret uh, the emotions behind speech or the emotional overtones of speech. Within the anterior association area, um, this is in the prefrontal cortex, it's a large region of the frontal lobe, so anterior frontal lobe. It will receive information from the posterior association area and will integrate information uh, coming from the posterior association area uh, with past experiences. It will then initiate and plan motor movements and will have links to the limbic system, which is more of that uh, emotional brain. We consider the limbic system part of the emotional brain. So the anterior association areas, um, they perform more complex functions. Uh, basically, the, the cerebral part of your brain is all in the um, frontal lobe, or the majority of it is in the frontal lobe. So we have complex functions within the anterior associations for thinking, perceiving, intentionally remembering, um, processing abstract ideas, reasoning, judgment, as well as impulse control, mental flexibility, social skills. I mean, you definitely need a lot of mental flexibility to take on human anatomy in a time of quarantine or, you know, take on three classes in a time of quarantine. Um, anterior association areas also um, form complex functions of humor, empathy, and conscience. You know, um, why we do things. What is the motivation that we do things? Do we do it because it's good or because we'll be rewarded for doing something good? Uh, if you guys ever watch uh, The Good Place, some, sometimes they pose those types of questions. Why do we do good? What is our motivation? Is it more selfish or, or is it actually really altruistic, you know, for the benefit of others or is it for the benefit of ourselves? You know, do we want to go to heaven? I mean, that's a reward if we do good, that kind of thing. So the anterior association areas kind of um, have... Uh, a hand in, you know, forming our conscience, kind of, you know, 
taking everyday things that we learn and, and forming uh, all these things that make us who we are. So we do have uh, neuroimaging techniques that reveal functions of specific parts of the prefrontal cortex. Uh, we know that the anterior pole of the frontal cortex is more active in solving the most complex problems, such as multitasking or even, you know, um, playing chess or doing things that kind of um, challenge your brain. Uh, so dealing with more complex problems, complex emotions, uh, cognition, all occurring at the anterior part of the frontal lobe. Additional function of the anterior association area is, can help you with your short-term memory, stores information for less than 30 seconds. After that, it's gone. No, after that, it can move to um, long-term memory if you so choose. And there are three working memory areas. We have the visual working memory. Hey, I remember that face. I think I, I taught that person like last semester. The auditory working memory. Um, if you hear something, oh yeah, I do remember Dr. Marcon mentioning that 30 seconds ago or talking about that for 30 seconds. And then we have the executive area. Finally, the third multimodal uh, sensory area is the limbic association areas. These are located on the medial side of the frontal lobe. This is our emotional brain, so involved with memory and emotions, integrates sensory and motor behaviors, aids in the formation of memories, um, as well as uh, processing emotions. Okay, so... Uh, that's basically it for the multimodal association areas. Um, we then go into lateralization of cortical functioning. So we know that we have two hemispheres that control the opposite sides of the body. This is considered contralateral, so opposite side. So the right hemisphere uh, controls the left, the left hemisphere controls the right. So hemispheres are specialized for different cognitive functions. So we talk about sometimes how people are more right brain versus left brain. So for example, if you are more left brained, um, the left cerebral hemisphere actually has control over language abilities, math, and logic, whereas the right cerebral hemisphere is more involved with visual spatial skills, reading facial expressions, uh, intuition, emotion, the artistic side, and artistic and musical skills. So. Um, Right cerebral hemisphere is more of the creative side uh, with music and art, whereas the left is more the, you know, rational thinking and logic side. And um, sometimes, you know, you might be one uh, hemisphere of the other, or you could be a combination of both and be super wicked smart like Dr. Margon. Just kidding. No, I am super smart. Um, <laughs> Uh, with regards to the tracks of the cerebral hemispheres, um, you know, we don't want to focus too much on it. Just know that they do um, uh, they do cross over. So that's why the right hemisphere has control of the left, and the left hemisphere has control of the uh, right. So different areas of the cerebral cortex, you know, we have cerebral white matter uh, contained within the different areas of the cerebral cortex uh, uh, that communicate with each other and communicate with the brain stem as well as the spinal cord. Uh, fibers communicating are usually uh, myelinated, myelinated and bundled into tracts. And we do have different tracts of cerebral white matter. Uh, we have our commissures. Uh, the corpus callosum is the largest commissure. So a commissure is composed of commissural fibers and allows communication between the cerebral hemispheres. So this corpus callosum um, is the largest commissure, which allows communication between the right and left hemispheres. And then we have our association fibers, which will connect different parts of the same hemisphere. So we talked about Wernicke's area um, and Broca's areas. Um, both have... Uh, similar areas on the right and left hemisphere. Okay, so we have association fibers that connect the two areas on the different sides of the hemispheres. And just uh, showing you the white matter 
fiber tracts of the cerebral hemisphere. So again, um, here is that corpus callosum, uh, that commissure, the largest commissure that connects the two hemispheres and allows for um, uh, communication between the right and left hemisphere. Okay. And then we have our association fibers going from Broca's and, and Wernicke's. Um, I wouldn't focus too much on these fiber tracks. Just know that there are tracks that connect the right and left hemisphere um, that allows communication between the two. Among other uh, white matter fiber tracks include projection fibers, which will run vertically, uh, descend from the cerebral cortex, and then ascend to the cortex from lower regions. Um, our cortical spinal tracks begin with those large pyramidal cells. Okay, so again, sort of a sagittal view showing you the different um, white fiber tracts. Uh, we have our commissural fibers within the corpus callosum, our association fibers, um, and then our projection fibers. I don't get too bogged down with the projection tracks. I'm actually uh, going to skip the rest of it. You guys can read it, but... Um, one important tract is the internal capsule, which uh, we have projection fibers that form a compact bu a bundle, which will pass between the thalamus and the basal nuclei. Okay, and we have the cor corona radiata. Uh, these fibers run to and from the cerebral cortex. We have the deep gray matter. So we had talked about the white matter. We have the deep gray matter, um, and it consists of these structures. Uh, the basal nuclei, uh, which are involved in motor control. Uh, we have the basal forebrain nuclei associated with memory. And uh, we have a, a structure called the claustrum, um, and we don't really know that function. Uh, then we have the amygdaloid body, which is located in the cerebrum, but is actually considered part of the limbic system, the emotional part of the brain. So the basal nuclei, I'm actually going to just slightly touch upon. So these are a group of nuclei deep uh, within the cerebral white matter. So again, basal nuclei are deep gray matter, but located uh, within the cerebral white matter. Okay. So the basal nuclei are formed from the caudate nucleus. The caudate nucleus arches over the thalamus, the putamen, and the globus pallidus. So the basal ganglia are, are complex neural calculators and cooperate with the cerebral cortex in controlling movement. They will receive input from many cortical areas. We also have um, an area called the substantia nigra, which also influences the basal ganglia. Now the substantia nigra, which in Latin stands for black substance, is actually um, pretty important because it uh, produces two very important neurotransmitters. Uh, we have uh, the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA, which is uh, gamma aminobutyric acid. It's a very important in inhibitory neurotransmitter. And also, most importantly, is the production of dopamine. Uh, dopamine is a neurotransmitter involved um, in movement, motivation, and can also be uh, uh, involved with addiction. Uh, for example, if we have um, if we have a condition that you guys might know, uh, Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is the loss of inhibitory input coming from the substantia nigra, which will then lead to an overactive uh, globus pallidus, so globus pallidus within the basal ganglia, uh, which will then inhibit the motor cortex. And has this what's known as the effect of a stuck brake on an auto automobile or bicycle. Okay, so um, Parkinson's is characterized by slow, jerky movements, tremors of the face, limbs, or hands, as well as muscle rigidity, uh, as well as uh, great difficulty in starting voluntary movements. Okay. So on this next uh, slide, we can see where the substantia nigra is located. Again, um, literal transmission uh, translation is black substance. Okay, and then here we see the parts of the basal ganglia, kind of um, lateral to the thalamus. 
um, So here's the thalamus if we see uh, a cross section. A um, looks like a what section is that? That is a transverse cross section. So we can see um, this is anterior posterior. The thalamus is here. Um, in between it, of course, we have the the third ventricle, um, and then parts of the lateral ventricle going into the different hemispheres. Um, but here's the thalamus and then it's surrounded by the basal ganglia or the basal nuclei. So evidence shows that they start, stop, and regulate intensity of voluntary movements. They select appropriate muscles for a task and will inhibit others um, and in some way can estimate the passage of time. Uh, the basal forebrain, forebrain nuclei um, includes these structures, uh, the septum, diagonal band of Broca, horizontal band of Broca, basal nucleus of Maynard. Um, don't, you know, focus too much of this. You can actually kind of focus on what, the, what it does. So uh, the basal forebrain nuclei is part of the cholinergic system, and the cholinergic system is important because they synthesize and release acetylcholine very important neurotransmitter um, within our uh, post and pre uh, synaptic neurons. Uh, located in the anterior dorsal to the hypothalamus, functions of the basal forebrain nuclei uh, includes arousal, learning, memory, motor control. Um, what is important to note for the basal forebrain nuclei is that degeneration of the nuclei, of the basal forebrain nuclei, is associated with Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so it's this uh, structure here. Uh, it's degeneration can cause Alzheimer's disease. So if you are going to study anything from this chapter, it would be to focus on table 13.2 in your book. What's great is it lists all the different parts of the brain um, and what they do. So you have the part and then the function. So if anything, if you just get tired of listening to my voice and you don't want to look at videos anymore, go to table 13.2. It summarizes everything and tells you everything of what different parts of the brain, um, what their functions are. Okay, so... If anything, study this table. It goes from you know the brainstem and the parts of the brainstem, um, reticular formation, and then different parts such as the cerebellum, what it does, the diencephalon, the cerebral hemispheres, the limbic system. So, if anything, study table thirteen point two. So, just going through the functional brain systems, uh, we talked about the limbic system, which is uh, spread widely in the forebrain. Uh, brain uh, systems are networks of neurons that function together. Uh, the reticular formation spans the brain stem. Um, we'll talk about the reticular formation just a little bit. Basically, um, according to your table 13.2, helps maintain cerebral cortical alertness, uh, filters out any repetitive stimuli, and then will re regulate skeletal and visceral muscle activity and help modulate pain. So first, the limbic system, this is located uh, in the medial aspect of the cerebral hemispheres, also within the diencephalon, and is composed of the septal nuclei, the cingulate gyrus, and the hippocampal formation, and is part of the amygdaloid body. Um, the fornix and other tracts link the limbic system together. Okay, so we know, again, the limbic system is part of the emotional brain. We have a structure called the cingulate gyrus, which allows us to shift between thoughts. Also allows us to interpret pain as unpleasant. Although there might be some people that actually do enjoy amount of pain, but um, I don't think it's due to the cingulate gyrus. Um, and then we have the hippocampal formation, uh, made up of the hippocampus and the parahippocampus. These regions encode, consolidate, and then later retrieve memories of facts and events. Um, the hippocampal formation actually receives information to be remembered, 
from the rest of the cerebral cortex. It will process this data and uh, returns them to the cortex where they are stored as long-term memories. Okay. And here we can see different parts of the limbic system. Uh, when I was doing autism research, we actually looked at uh, the different parts of the limbic system, particularly the uh, hippocampus and the parahippocampus. Okay, so you have um, the parahippocampus here and then the hippocampus here. Uh, for us, it kind of looks like um, we prepared it to sort of like looking like a seahorse. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but um, when I process slices of brain, we had to look for uh, parts of the hippocampus in our in our stains. Um, so these are the cerebral structures of the limbic system, again, part of our emotional brain. Um, I know the amygdala uh, definitely has something to do with, with memories, particularly uh, women who give birth. Um, they usually quickly forget the pain of birth so that they'll do it again and it has something to do with the functioning of the limbic system. I'm not going to go into um, the reticular formation too much. What I am going to talk about is the reticular activating system. Um, it has widespread connections, which I deal for arousal of the brain as a whole, helps to maintain consciousness and alertness, uh, which is what Dr. Barakhan needs after weeks of not sleeping. Uh, functions in sleep and arousal from sleep, um, I guess doesn't help me sleep. Uh, malfunctions in people with narcolepsy. Okay, so if a person sleeps for very long periods of time, it's due to a malfunctioning reticular activating system. Uh, so again, the reticular formation, don't worry too much about the tracks. I know just, you know, what it does. We're not going to go into, you know, how it works, but just to have an idea of what it does. Again, go to table 13.2 and it'll explain everything. So now we're going to go into how the brain is protected. We talked about our meninges. Uh, the brain is protected from injury by the skull, because the skull is a very hard bone. Um, and also the meninges, which are the different layers covering the brain. We have cerebrospinal fluid, which we talked about in lab, is secreted by the choroid plexuses within the ventricles. Okay, and then we have the blood-brain barrier. So some of the functions of the meninges help to cover and protect the central nervous system, enclose and protect the vessels that supply the central nervous system, and also contain cerebral spinal fluid, which flows between the pia and arachnoid maters, which is that subarachnoid space. First meninge, or of the meninges that we'll talk about is the dura mater. Again, stands for tough mother. The dura mater is the strongest of the meninges. It's composed of two layers. We have the periosteal layer and the meningeal layer. Um, we know that these two layers are fused except to include the dural sinuses. When I was in med school, we actually had to peel back and figure out which one was the periosteal layer and which one was the meningeal layer. Basically, the periosteal layer is the one closest to the uh, bones of the skull and the meningeal layer is underneath. So this is a really uh, good diagram because it shows you the meninges around the brain. Okay, so we have that outer uh, layer, which is the dura mater, and again, it's made up of two layers. We have the periosteal meningeal. Uh, underneath that, which and we saw that in lab, it looks like a spider web. Spider web bleh, um, that is the arachnoid mater. Below that is the subarachnoid space, where um, the a cerebral spinal fluid flows, and then we have the pia mater. So that pia mater is what actually covers uh, the cortex, um, or that you know that first layer of the brain. So within the door mater, we have the largest sinus, and this is the superior sagittal sinus, which will drain blood away from the brain. Uh, the dura mater will extend inward to subdivide the cranial cavity by creating a structure known as the falx cerebri. So we can actually see this. So here is the falx cerebri. Unfortunately, it's not on your worksheet, and I wish it was because we have really nice brain sections 
um, as well as pictures that shows you this Fox cerebri, which separates right and left hemisphere. Okay, and then we have the dural sinuses, which run through the uh, dura mater. Again, uh, kind of draining blood away from the brain. Uh, this sinus right here is the superior sagittal sinus, um, so contained within the longitudinal fissure. And then if we have a superior, of course, we'll have the inferior sagittal sinus. Arachnoid mater, located beneath the dura mater, contain arachnoid villi, which project through the dura mater and allow for central uh, cerebrospinal fluid to pass into the dural blood sinuses. And again, it has that spider web appearance and uh, the space below the arachnoid mater is the subarachnoid space where cerebrospinal fluid will flow. Then we have the pia mater, which is delicate connective tissue, which clings tightly to the surface of the brain and follows all convolutions of the cortex. Uh, we talked about the cerebrospinal fluid in lab. Um, the CSF is formed in the choroid plexuses in the brain ventricles. Um, it's located in all four ventricles and is composed of ependymal cells and capillaries. Um, cerebrospinal fluid arises from blood and about 500 milliliters is produced per day. However, only 100 to 160 milliliters are present at any one time. So uh, here we see formation, location, and circulation of cerebrospinal fluid. Um, I'm not going to be focusing too much on is uh, its formation by the choroid plexuses. However, I do want you to take a look at this picture that shows you uh, the flow of cerebral spinal fluid and circulation. So, you know, here we start off at number one. We have the different ventricles and um, cerebral spinal fluid is produced by the choroid plexuses of each ventricle and then will flow through the uh, ventricles and into the subarachnoid space. So we go from you know lateral ventricles and then through this interventricular foramen into the third ventricle here, uh, which is surrounded by the, the thalamus and the hypothalamus uh, lateral to it. And then from the third ventricle, it will go through this cerebral aqueduct and then into this fourth ventricle. Um, from there, from the fourth ventricle, it will either go through the central canal of the spinal cord or it will go into the subarachnoid space uh, via the different apertures. So we have uh, a median aperture of Magendi and a lateral aperture of Lushka. Okay, from then it will just then flow into the subarachnoid space. The blood brain barrier is important because it prevents most blood borne toxins from entering the brain. Uh, due to the impermeability of the capillaries, meaning not a lot is going through. However, it's not an absolute barrier. Uh, we have nutrients. This is oxygen because we do need oxygen to our brain. Nutrients such as oxygen pass through the blood-brain barrier um, and can also allow passage of alcohol, nicotine, and anesthetics. Spinal cord, um, we talked about it in lab. Functions of the spinal cord, we have the spinal nerves that will attach to it and provides a two-way conduction pathway. Also is the major center for reflexes. We talked about reflexes, the five components of the reflexes uh, in the previous chapter. The spinal cord runs through the vertebral canal um, and extends from the foramen magnum, uh, the base of the skull, to the level of um, L1 or L2. So we have different parts of the spinal cord. We have uh, this distal, most distal portion called the conus medullaris. So the conus medullaris is the inferior end of the spinal cord that kind of ends in a little pointy tip. Uh, the phylum terminale is a long filament of connective tissue that kind of goes from the tip of the conus medullaris um, and then will attach to the coccyx inferiorly. We then, within the spinal cord, have enlargements, uh, the cervical and lumbar enlargements. These are um, where we have the nerves for the upper and lower limbs uh, coming from or arising. And then at the very end of the spinal cord, we have what looks like a horse's tail. So we call it the cauda equina. The cauda equina is a collection of spinal nerve roots.
Okay, so here we have um, the cervical enlargement, um, which f where the um, the nerves of the upper limb will come from along the spinal cord. We know that it's surrounded by dura and arachnoid matter um, in the cadaver lab. You'll actually be able to reflect back the dura matter and then see, uh, you might be able to see the spider web like structures of the arachnoid matter. And then you have the lumbar enlargement um, where the nerves for the lower limbs will come from. You then have uh, this pointy end called the conus middleoris. And then from the codus middleoris, you have uh, the horse's tail structures. So just um, a bunch of nerves at the end uh, forming a horse's tail or also known as the cauda equina. And then you have this one long um, uh, stringy like structure. This is the phylum terminale, which goes from the tip of the conus middleoris to the coccyx inferiorly. Okay. The spinal cord segments indicate the region of the spinal cord from which the spinal nerves will emerge. It is designated by the spinal nerve that issues from it. So T1 is the region where the first thoracic nerve will emerge. Okay. So we can see that at around, for, so from C1 to about, uh, C, here we see spinal nerve C8. So from C1 uh, to C7, you can see that the spinal nerves go uh, over or above the, um, the vertebral level. So spinal nerve C1 is above C1. Uh, C2 is above uh, the vertebral body for C2 and so forth. And then we were we will hit um, C7, but notice that we do not have a C8, um, but we do have a spinal nerve, C8, okay? So C8 will actually go underneath or below C7, and from there on, the spinal nerves uh, will be named for the vertebral body that's above it, okay? So from uh, C1 to C7, uh, the spinal nerves um, are labeled or um, identified based on the vertebral body below uh, the spinal nerve. And then from T1 on, uh, T1 will actually be named for the vertebral uh, body above it. So T1 is below vertebral level T1, T2. Spinal nerve is below vertebral level uh, T2, okay? So C7 is above and then T1 uh, will be an onward will be below. Now, uh, spinal nerve in the lower regions, the spinal segments are not adjacent to their corresponding vertebrae. That is um, because the spinal cord actually grows more slowly than the vertebral column during uh, development. So, for example, the spinal cord segment L1 kind of starts up up here and then. Uh, we'll see the spinal nerve uh, growing down and then, of course, going below the um, vertebral body for uh, L1. I'm not going to get too much into um, the spinal cord. Uh, we do have different grooves um, that we'll be able to see in a histo slide of the spinal cord. We have the posterior median sulcus and the anterior median fissure. So, sulcus is uh, posterior, the fissure is anterior. Um, spinal cord is made up of an outer region of white matter, which is composed of myelinated and non-myelinated axons, which will allow communication between the spinal cord and the brain. And we have the different uh, classes of fibers. So fibers are classified by type. We have ascending fibers, ascending fibers, which are sending uh, impulses or signals from the, uh, from the periphery up to the integration center or up to the central nervous system. Descending fibers carrying motor. So we have sensory, which is ascending, and motor, which are uh, descending fibers. And then we have uh, commissural fibers. Again, those fibers that allow for communication between the two sides. Um, within the spinal cord, we know that um, the gray matter is shaped like an H, and we have the gray commissure, which 
will contain that central canal where cerebrospinal fluid can flow. Um, so the gray matter is made up of dorsal horns, which consists of interneurons, um, which relay uh, sensory information up uh, the spinal cord. And then we have our ventral and lateral horns, which will contain cell bodies of motor neurons. So earlier in the semester, we looked at histocytes for multipolar motor neurons, and these were located in the uh, ventral horns. So here we see that H shape of uh, the gray matter within the spinal cord. Okay, um, here's a nice picture or figure of that anatomy, and then here's the histo slide uh, of the spinal cord. So we have the uh, the white matter here. We have the different. Um, uh, we have the dorsal median sulcus, and then we have the ventral median fissure. We have the different horns. We have uh, the dorsal horns and then the ventral horns, and some of them do have a, a lateral horn. So dorsal containing interneurons for the um, passing on of sensory information from the periphery to the brain, and then our motor neurons uh, within the ventral horns. So gray matter is primarily neuronal cell bodies and some non-myelinated axons. And we again, we have the different uh, regions of gray matter, the gray commissure, uh, which is that band within that H that uh, between the um, both sides of the horns. So we have dorsal horns, ventral and lateral horns. Now it can be divided into uh, somatic and visceral regions. I'm not going to go over this. Um, you guys can read upon it. Just know that the dorsal aspect of the uh, spinal cord deals mostly with sensory, whereas the uh, ventral portion deals with motor. Okay, and you can take a look at uh, where you can see the sensory versus motor um, fibers. Okay, so here we have, in order to remember that this is the dorsal, uh, these are the dorsal roots, we have a dorsal root ganglion. It's only located dorsally, okay? So this is where sensory information will go towards the spinal cord and then uh, along the ascending tracts. And then we have uh, information coming from the motor cortex or other areas of the brain that will go down the spinal cord and then out via the, um, the ventral roots. And protection of the spinal cord is the same as protection of the brain. You have the outer dura mater, which is... Again, that single layer surrounding the spinal cord, and then the um, arachnoid mater underneath lies deep to the dura, and then the pia mater, which is the innermost, uh, which is a delicate layer of connective tissue, will extend all the way to the contents and contains denticulate ligaments, which are lateral extensions of the pia mater. Uh, cerebrospinal fluid fills the hollow cavities of the brain and spinal cord, will help provide liquid cushion for the spinal cord and brain, also helps nourishes the brain and spinal cord, removes any wastes, and will carry chemical signals between parts of the central nervous system. Uh, here we actually see a diagram of a lumbar, lumbar puncture. Um, you have to kind of palpate and go in between uh, the spinous processes of the lumbar vertebrae. So here are the bodies of our lumbar vertebrae, and then we have our um, our spinous processes. So we have a space between uh, the two uh, processes, and we want to enter the needle into the subarachnoid space, okay? So that we can grab samples of the cerebrospinal fluid to determine if a patient is, you know, has an actual infection of the brain, such as meningitis. Um, that's an important reason why we have lumbar puncture. And, you know, again, we have the different pathways, um, ascending pathways, carrying sensory information to more rostral areas, uh, descending pathways, carrying motor information uh, to more caudal regions of the central nervous system. You don't need to know the different tracks. Know that there are ascending tracks and descending tracks. I'm not going to go over that. Nope. Uh, disorders. Disorders of the central nervous system. Of course, we have spinal cord damage. Um, 
Paralysis is defined as the loss of motor function. Paresthesia is the loss of sensation. Um, when we have paraplegia, um, we have paralysis of the lower limbs. So this can be injury to the spinal cord between T1 and L2. Now, the higher the injury gets, the more limbs are, um, are involved uh, with the paralysis. So paraplegia, um, damage or injury to T1 and L2, uh, causing paralysis of the lower limbs. Quadriplegia, uh, injury to the spinal cord in the cervical region, causing paralysis of all four limbs. We have brain degenerative diseases, such as a stroke, also known as cerebrovascular accident. This is when you have blockage or interruption of blood flow to the brain region. Alzheimer's disease, uh, again, this is a progressive degenerative disease, which leads to dementia. Uh, we talked about the brain area that might be responsible for Alzheimer's disease, uh, that being to uh, the uh, basal forebrain nuclei. We have congenital malformations, uh, which occur um, during embryonic development. So uh, we have hydrocephalus. Hydro means water or fluid. So we have an accumulation of fluid within the, uh, the brain. Uh, and if this happens in a, a newborn or a child, um, usually what happens is you have, um, if the fontanelles have not come together yet, you'll have sort of a swelling that occurs in the head. Uh, there's neural tube defects, such as anencephaly. Uh, back a few years ago, we had the Zika virus scare that came from mosquitoes. You know, we advised women who were in reproductive age not to travel to areas where uh, they have the Zika virus because it ca could cause anencephaly. So A means without, so meaning a baby is born without a head, basically, without the cerebrum and cerebellum. Uh, another neural tube defect would be spina bifida, where you have the absence of the vertebral lamina, um, part of the uh, the vertebral bone. Cerebral palsy. Um, this is when we have uh, poor control of the voluntary muscles, uh, results from damage to the motor cortex. Some postnatal changes in the brain. So, brain structures will complete development at different times and of course there are critical periods in learning um, especially very early on you know children learn uh, language from their parents or from you know outside sources that surround them and it occurs pretty early um, some people think that you know they can teach their children foreign languages even in utero but um, not a lot of studies have been done showing that but you know more music the better or more the more you talk to your child, the more that they can develop language, even by, you know, uh, kind of encouraging them to read, kind of expands their vocabulary. Um, we know that some development of the brain occurs into the early 20s. However, with age, um, we have a decline of brain function uh, attributed to many changes in neural circuitry, as well as the amount of neurotransmitters being released. All right, guys, that's the second part of chapter 13. Um, enjoy.